There is no minimalist rule book. Well, until now, the minimalists have created 16 Rules for Living with Less, a free ebook which you can download right now at theminimalists.com slash resources. Enjoy. Can you apply minimalism to politics? We kind of talked about that a little bit. We did. I, I just wanted to uh, talk about the sort of minimalist presidency. What, what would that look like? Um, I don't know whether or not you're a fan of Calvin Coolidge. Um, but I do, I'm a big fan of his values. Whether or not he executed well on them, I actually think he probably didn't in his second term because one of his kids died. Um, anyway, we have this essay on our website. Someone asked us about being this, the, a minimalist president. I just wanted to read a few quotes from Calvin Coolidge. So, so if, Will, your question is about um, could there be a, a minimalist president, well, I think the answer is, yeah, probably. But um, we need, I think, well, I mean, we don't need to do this right now, but I think that question needs to define what minimalist president is. Cause when we asked that question on the shorter uh, podcast, you were like, Oh, that means less government. Or when I hear that question, I think, Oh, more intentional spending with the government mm -hmm. where someone else might think communism, which we have been compared to communists in different articles before. <laughs> so, so Calvin Coolidge <laughs> was the uh, uh, 30th president of the United States uh, during the, the roaring twenties. Um, he followed a very corrupt president, uh, Harding, who is, I think, a distant cousin of Podcast Sean, actually. Uh, <laughs> Warren G. Harding. Should we hold that against Sean Harding? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we should tear, tear his statue down. Yeah, we're going to tear his <laughs> statue down, Harding. All right, so during the 67 months of uh, Calvin Coolidge's presidency, the national debt, the federal government, the federal budget, unemployment, and consumer prices shrank, and the GDP expanded significantly, um, which led Coolidge's biographer to call Silent Howe a rare kind of hero, a minimalist president, an economic general of budgeting. And so um, I said, but perhaps the best way to understand Coolidge's minimalist ways is through his own words. So here's his quote on contribution. No person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been the reward for what he gave. Mm. And so, I mean, that's a uh, contribution is, uh, is something that you Ryan and I often talk about yeah. when we talk about giving it, that's so much more if I gave Ryan something he it's not like well, hey Ryan let's celebrate what you what you received it, mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way it's about how are we able to contribute beyond ourselves in a meaningful way uh, on spending he said there is no dignity quite so impressive and no independence quite so important as living within your means I can't even imagine most politicians even saying that now. It almost takes kooks to say, live within your means. Yeah. Um, you're anti-capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, or you're, you're, uh, or you're, you know, you're an anarchist or whatever. Yeah. Um, but why is, I don't know, Kim, why is living within the government, does, because they have the ability to print money, they don't even have means, right? <laughs> they don't produce well, money. Well, it depends. It seems like they, they do put that on some people. You know, they'll say, well, you want some handouts? Well, you need to live within your means. You know, mm. we're not going to give you anything, but we got to go give these other people a bunch of trillions of dollars. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, to, to go back to a minimalist um, government, when, what came to mind for me was the Labor Party in England. So they just, in the UK, they just had their elections and, you know, Boris Johnson mm -hmm. and uh, the Tories ended up winning. But one of the criticisms that people had against the Labor Party was that when you looked at their booklet of what they were proposing, it was like pages upon pages upon pages of policies. Mm. I mean, they just needed to whittle it down mm, to yeah. just a few main policies that you care about. Simplify. And I, right, simplify mm. it. And I think what's happened in both the Democrat and the Republican parties, and one thing that um, w the problem that we're seeing is that people feel like they have to agree with everything on the platform right, in order to be this X, Y, Z. So it's sort of the purity test, right, where you have to agree 100%. And the problem is, is that they've expanded, each of these parties have expanded beyond just fiscal policy or governmental policy. They include all these moral policies mm -hmm. and all of, you know, all of these various different policies mm -hmm. that are now encompassed in. And it's like, you know, it's very difficult to have a nuanced perspective, even if you do agree with somebody you know, for me, I say I, I can support a candidate if I agree with them. 85% mm. is what I like. Yeah. Ideally, if, they, if I don't agree with somebody, anybody, 85%, then I have to obviously keep going down the percentage, right? Right, sure. But 85%. At some point, you know, you've identified I'm not going to vote for either. Right, right. Because I just don't agree with either of them enough 
to the, where, yeah. This so, is why we need more than two parties, though. This is, this a, is really why. Yeah. B- because otherwise, totally the box agree. is too big, and you're not going to agree with 85% of just about anyone if you have if it's Coke versus Pepsi, or right now, you know, swamp water versus toilet water, or whatever it is. Right. It's like, <laughs> well, which one would I rather drink? Well, uh, and also, no, I just won't. <laughs> right. Right. And when you have platforms that are so large, and you feel obligated to agree with, you know, it's easier for me to agree with 85% of somebody's platform if their platform has, let's say, five items. Right. Right? Mm. But if their platform has 50 items, yeah. suddenly I have to go through all those 50 and figure out what percentage of these do I agree with. Right. So if we just focused our politics on things that were actually really meaningful, that government can actually control, mm-hmm. then though, and things that we want government to control, mm-hmm. then we could, you know, that is where I think we would have like trying to dwindle down. And I think that's what we really need to do. We really need to dwindle down all of these huge platforms that they just include way too much. Yeah. And then you end up like the Labor Party in the UK where it was like page upon page. I mean, just ridiculous yeah. policy after ridiculous and, policy. And that's why it's so difficult. I know, Ryan, we were voting in the last uh, election on all the local issues, and we talk about local being so important. I, I had to spend, my wife and I spent like an entire day going through what's this judge and this yeah, judge. Yeah. And, 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 be, and finding information on people is difficult. Right. Like right. some of the candidates, it's like you... Like it was a note to self, like if I ever, ru- which I never would, but if I ever ran for public office, you could go to what are Ryan Nicodemus's political values mm-hmm. dot com, where like some people like they they're buried. It's even hard to figure out what their yeah. what their viewpoints are, what their positions are.